Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, when the parents brought in the child of Jesus to do for him the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. The Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke out a child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Are we? we have, as a worship team, said that every Sabbath can be different. So I hope you appreciated being part of kind of a synagogue experience where we all read the scriptures together. Uh, the Bible says, in fact, the psalmist says, thy word, finish it for me, have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. And if you're with me today, let's just understand that sin is when we're not with God, either in our minds or in our actions or in our words. Sin is a broken relationship with God. It's what happens when we're not in relationship to him. That's the difference between sin and sins. Sins are the things we do when we are not in relationship to God. Righteousness and right acts are the things that we do when we are in relationship to God. So it's really just a question of who you're plugged into. So as you stood in this moment, this moment in your life, and you read the scripture with your fellow Christians, your fellow God followers, I hope that, that you knew that it was important and it's meaningful and will never, ever forget. Marty, it's lovely to have your family with us today, and I'm so grateful that they're with us. And we were having a moment of reacquaintance outside, and we were saying, this day is part of our eternal life. If you believe in Jesus as your personal savior, we say this at funerals, don't we? Why not say it now? 
If you believe as G in Jesus as your personal savior from sin, what has already begun? Eternal your eternal life. Yes. Because we say this at funerals, oh, it's okay, we don't grieve like other people because we will live again. We will con continue. Don't we say that? We will continue the life that Jesus has given us. The fact that you are drawing breath today, the fact that you are alive today means that God is in your life. Amen. Now the fact is we give praise to God for that. And in fact, we give praise to him on the Sabbath. And we celebrate on the Sabbath because he created the world and he created the Sabbath and he said, it is good. And then, after 430 years of slavery, the people of Israel were reminded. That's why he said, remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember that it belonged to God in the first place and that he gave it to Adam and Eve as their wedding present. Amen? Okay, when does the day begin according to the Bible? The evening and the morning. So the day begins on Friday night. When was Adam and Eve's wedding? Friday afternoon, evening. And what was their wedding present? Sabbath. Sabbath. Come on. When we come together, we are celebrating the present that God has given to the entire human race. Isn't it wonderful? I didn't even know that I was going to tell you that this morning. <laughs> the last two Sabbaths, I've, I've talked about pilgrim. Pilgrim 1, Pilgrim 2. So today's Pilgrim 3. Today is about being an Adventist pilgrim. In the truest sense of the word Advent. We're coming up to the celebration that the world will take notice of. Christmas. But before we get there, there's Thanksgiving. There's Thanksgiving and there's a lot of Thanksgiving in my heart. Thanksgiving that Richard and Annika Guy will be here in this pulpit next Sabbath. On Thanksgiving Sabbath, I will be in Calgary, Canada with my children. And I am giving thanks already and pleading with God for a safe journey and also that he will give his words to Richard and Annika. In this situation here in Luke chapter 2, the Messiah has come. But today we are celebrating, we're looking forward to, we are part of a congregation of people who are saying the Messiah is coming again. You agree, right? Amen. That's what amen means, I agree. So if you agree, you can say amen. Amen. We call ourselves Adventists because we are not only looking back to the first time Jesus came, but we're also looking forward to the next time that he will come. The second advent of the Messiah. The people in Jesus' day were pilgrims. They were people on a journey that God had started them out with their ancestor Abraham and had been with them ever since. And so here comes the person that had been promised from the very beginning, even before Abraham had been promised to Eve, that there would be one who would come, the promised one, and that he would save his people, his people, the ones that he had chosen. And so living with this knowledge, all of these generations, thousands of years in fact, now comes down to the moment when in God's time, which I wrote in a, 
in an email, not, well, uh, on, a, on a comment that a friend of mine made on Facebook this week. He came, what does the Bible say? In the fullness of time. Whose time? God's time. He knows when the disciples at the very end of Jesus' time on earth, when they ask him, is it time? What does he say? My father is in charge of the time. So, so here, here we look at a scene where the first advent has happened and we as, as fellow pilgrims now in almost 2020 are looking forward to the second advent of Jesus, I thought it would be wise for us to place ourselves in the story today in an updated fashion. To look for some of the metaphors that this story, I believe, uses to teach us who we are and where we are going. I am pretty excited about this. Let's go. Living, living with centuries of tradition, centuries of ideas and history, you have a people who have been on a pilgrimage for a very long time. They're going towards a kingdom, a kingdom where, where the son of David will usher in new glory for Israel. See, David had been pretty much the top. All you Old Testament Bible students, your mind is working right now. That's good because I want you to think about all the kings that came after David and just, just how many kings did it take before the kingdom just blew apart? Before there was a Samaria and a Jerusalem before some people liked some others and others didn't like others. How long did it take for the chosen people of God to become more preoccupied with themselves than with their God? So it is that, that the coming one was going to be known as the son of David and that he would bring back the glory days of Israel. When this event actually happens, the question that I have for us this morning is, who's watching? We call ourselves Adventists, so bear, bear with me here. I'm going to ping pong back and forth between what was happening in the story here for these people, for Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and I'm going to be making applications to us today. So. Don't get confused with that. Who's, who's watching? Who was watching? Simeon and Anna. Hence the text for today. Who are they and what can we learn from them since we claim, you see, to be Adventists? The question that I have for us this morning is, are we watching? Are we watching for his second coming? It's something that has characterized my life to be part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church so you can be uh, with me or not with me when you watch certain programming that adds, still, by the way, adds the Seventh-day Adventist Church into the list of known cults today right alongside Jim Jones. Are we watching? Luke 2 is the birth story of the Messiah. You have this pilgrim people and the question that we have today that we're zeroing in on this piece, who was watching? Number one, in Luke 2, we have the shepherds. We have the shepherds. They, they were watching. Allow me to disengage my phone so that I will not be interrupted with it. 
They're in the field because I think this story is important to note where people are in the story. You've got two locations and you have two groups of people. The first is the shepherds. They are in the field. The second is in this particular story that Luke constructs for us in his gospel, which by the way was very important that he included all people. So you're gonna hear that. Please, please be listening for that phrase, all people, okay? The second group of people, the second is the people in the temple. And in particular, you have two old people. So you've got people who have been connected to the doing of chosenness, if you like, for a very, very long time. In fact, we're given Anna's age at the moment that she comes in contact with the Messiah. She's 84. Now today, we're thinking 84 is pretty young, amen? All right? As I'm getting older, I'm thinking 80, oh, 84, forget it, man. We've got, I've got friends who are in their 90s. Three score, not, does it say four score, Eric? No, it says three score and 10, doesn't it? Three score is 20 times three and 10 is 70. So if you are over 70 today, my friends, you are over the limit. <laughs> Fortunately, there was another limit. God gave it at the time of the flood. What was it? 120. I think it was Noah and maybe one or two others that lived longer than that after the flood. Previously, people had been living eight, nine hundred years. Amazing, even with the effects of, of the rebellion. So you have two, two groups of people. You have the shepherds and you have these two older people. Jesus, we're going we're gonna to zero in on the two older people situation here in Luke 2.21. It's on the eighth day. Now here we are on the seventh day. But there's this tradition within the chosen people's environment that there was circumcision. Now, we won't go into the, the physical details, but just understand that this was a marking. This was something that Moses had to get involved with and also then his people. This marking in the body. Understand that this is metaphoric it's also literal in this case but it must you must understand that this is metaphoric because Jesus uses it and says that it is more important that your hearts be circumcised than your bodies so understand that God puts this this procedure in place in order to make an impression <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> We, we do, we, we, we're very impressed. No anesthetic, poor child. He, he's not impressed in any, any really good way, but he doesn't understand. Now, medically, we know that it's the eighth day that the blood clots the best. Okay, byproduct, I don't know, but God is the God who made us. He understands us. He says, on the eighth day, bring all of your males in and they will be circumcised and they will be marked. So you have this, this identification moment. Yes, the other day I went up to the animal shelter and I bought dog tags for my mom's dog and for my dog. And yes, I didn't know that if you're over 55, you get it at $7 instead of 20. So I made a donation, <laughs> a very big donation. Besides which, I was late, so that was an even bigger donation. <laughs> Jesus, the, the, the God child, is marked, and he is named. This is, the, this is the moment when the community recognizes him, and, and, and he is connected in his body. He is connected to the community. So who's watching? 
When he goes through this procedure, this process that is ages old now, that shows that he is connected to the community, who's watching? Well, Simeon. Chapter 2, verse 25 says that he was a devout and religious person. It goes on, Luke goes on to say that the Spirit was upon him. Now, I have said, and we'll say again in this moment, I don't want to be like the disciples before Pentecost. I want to be like Simeon. What is the similarity between Simeon and the disciples after Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon him, it says, and he is on a mission, and he is told, you are not going to die. He's an old man. You are not going to die until you see the one. The one. He's a pilgrim, and he's on a pilgrimage, and he is told, your pilgrimage is not going to end until you see the one. Once again, how's your eternal life going today? Are you on a pilgrimage? Are you on a pilgrimage to the visual kingdom of God, realizing that you are citizens of the kingdom of God now by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And you, like these other chosen people, are in anticipation of the second coming of the Messiah. He is directed to be in the temple. The Spirit of God is upon him, and he is directed, go to the temple. It's time to be in the temple. I have to, I have to bring up 1 Peter chapter 2 here, you see, because he says, Peter says, we are living stones built up into the temple of God. So this, this scene that you are seeing here happens in the temple. Jesus is coming in and as the God man, he is being grafted in. You could use, use that very agrarian term or you could say he is also one of the living stones. He is the corner stone of this temple upon which he's, he's the foundation stone of this temple. So temple here is a metaphor for what we would call church, or what we would call what we would call congregation, what we would call our church family, or church even larger. Temple is a spiritual metaphor for the pilgrim people of God. And here he is, the king, son of David, and he's being brought into the temple. And Simeon who is also one of these living stones under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is told to go and be in the temple. It's time, Simeon. You're going to get to see him. You will come to the end now of your mission. Your mission has been to wait for him, to tell other people about him, and now you will get to see him. And then you know what happens. So in Luke 2, 28, Simeon welcomes this, this child king, and he welcomes him very, it's, again, the metaphor is just beautiful, this living stone, this part of the temple, in the temple, welcomes him into his arms and says to the God of heaven, I, 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 I don't know, it, it, it's just amazing to me to think here is God incarnate in the arms of a man who has waited to see him face to face. I don't know about you, but there is a, there is a desire in my heart, a deep desire in my heart to see 
God face to face. Moses wanted it too, you know. And God said, no, your body, it's, it's in decay. If you see me face to face, you will die. He's 120, you know. He reached the limit. He's on Mount Nebo. And he dies. How come? Bible's very clear. He was hale and hearty. He was not sick. He was not looking like he was going to die. But yet he goes up on that mountain and he dies. Very interesting stuff. Stuff that I like to look into because before, you see, he didn't see the face of God. Now my theory, it's just mine alone, based on Jude verse 9, is that he got to look into the face of God. And he died in the arms of God. Just like Jesus coming to the temple, Simeon lifts up this baby and says, God, you've given me what I have always wanted. The question is for us today, my friends, is this what you want? Above everything else, to be in the temple, to be part of that living stone situation, and to be the one who sees God face to face, looks into those beautiful eyes, to be spirit-led, to be Jesus-focused, father blessing to be that kind of pilgrim. So in Luke 2.29 he basically gives the last speech of his life and says to God now, now I can go. I've been given this privilege. I, I can go on. I can go on to the next phase. Is this not why, again, at funerals, we talk about the fact that we don't grieve like other people who do not have the hope of a future. We grieve not because uh, we, we, we don't think that we will see people again. We grieve because we still don't have them in the present. And we're sad about that. But don't, don't so many of us live our lives separated from our families? That's why I'm so excited about going to Calgary because I'll get to see my kids. I think of it as like going to San Diego. I have friends whose kids live in San Diego, and they don't see, they don't see their kids any more than I do. So kids who've come home to see your parents, all the way from Southern University, thank you for coming to bridge that gap, because we like being with you. We really do. <laughs> and you know, that feeling of wanting to be together, it's so strong, and especially at times like Thanksgiving, Christmas, the holidays, the holy days. Simeon had that same, that same desire in his heart. I, he says, now I can go on to the next phase because I know that my Redeemer liveth. Yeah? I feel it too. I don't know if you do. My eyes have seen, verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. Is, is it not our biggest desire to know that we are saved? It seems to be what most Christians in this world are interested in. And I would imagine... Uh, even the conversations I've had with people who don't believe in God the way that I do, that it is also their biggest desire is to know that there is an afterlife, to know that there is a next phase, to know that they will reach that and that it doesn't matter if death, which is a part of this this part of our eternal life, it doesn't matter if death comes creeping in the room. Because I know that there is a God who will come back for me. This is Simeon. This is Simeon. He, he, he is saying, God, I've seen him now. I can go because I know that I have a future. 
My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared. And get this, this is the key piece that I told you Luke was going to write. Which you have prepared in the presence of all people. Don't you love the emphasis? I love the emphasis of Luke, you see, because this is something that Nicodemus didn't understand. This is why Jesus says to him, for God so loved the whole world. No, Nicodemus, not just the chosen people that I have been working with since Abraham. No, no, no. I have come for the whole world. And right here in the very beginning, as Jesus is being presented according to the law to God... Simeon identifies him as being the one who will save all people. Now, I do not have an a Israelite lineage, but I gave my heart to God a long, long time ago, and I have been part of his family, grafted in, as the Apostle Paul says, and this text right here at the very heart of the story is this moment when, when we know as people who have been grafted into the kingdom of God that we have a future. So it's okay to be an Adventist. It's okay to look forward to the second coming. He'll be a light for revelation to the Gentiles, the people that are not chosen yet. And he will be also, get this, for the glory of thy people, Israel. The pilgrims. Thy people, Israel. The pilgrims. Or, if you're an Adventist pilgrim today, you can hear... You can hear him saying that there will be glory. Why? What, what, what glory will there be? We, we sing about it. Oh, that will be glory. Really? You sure you want the glory? What glory will there be? He's saying, he's saying there will be glory for the people of Israel who have always been the ones on pilgrimage. No, my friends, we should not be arrogant. We should not be lifting up our eyes and saying, oh, I'm so thankful I'm not. Remember that story Jesus told about the Pharisee and the publican? I don't want to be that Pharisee. Do you? God didn't listen to his prayer. I don't want to be that Adventist, that, that forward-looking Christian, looking forward to the second coming, saying that I am a seventh-day Adventist. I don't want to be that kind of Adventist that is proud and haughty and looking for my own glory. That doesn't help the kingdom of God. But then comes verse 33. Now you will know why I'm saying what I'm saying because he says, Simeon says, this child. As you look into the faces of your little children, moms and dads, what are you going to say about them? This is what Simeon said about Jesus. This child is set for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. Do you know what immediately came to my mind when I read that? That moment, and Ellen White illuminates this moment in her book, Desire of Ages, when he stands in the temple, get this, in the place where the Gentiles were allowed to be in the temple. He stands there. They say he had a whip in his hand. I'm an African. I understand what an African diadem looks like. No, it doesn't look like the Queen of England's jewels. It's usually something that has some kind of animal hair attached to the end 
and is used somewhat like a swatter. But it is a signal of his authority. And Ellen says that divinity flashed through humanity as he looked at these guys who had brought money changing into the temple. And he says, my house will be called a house of prayer. Communication with God for all people all nations. So here, even 30 plus years before that moment, Simeon is saying, this child is set for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. He literally upset the economy, the money changing. They had squashed out the Gentiles and said, they don't matter. We will put our money-changing tables for our money-changing operation for the buying and selling of sacrifices in the place where the Gentiles are supposed to be able to come and worship the one true The irony is not lost on me, my friends. I hope it is not lost on you. This is happening in the temple, inside the people of God. And so Simeon's prophecy comes true on that day that Jesus literally upsets the status quo. What is the reaction? <laughs> Those money changer overlords up there in the Sanhedrin began to plot his death. God help us. God help us. If we're not, if we're not shepherds, if we're not people in the temple under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then what are we? Verse 36, we meet a very old, the Bible says, a very old, and by those days' standards she was because the, the life expectancy in those days was not what it is today. So the fact that the Bible tells us she was 84 is amazing and that she was only married for seven of those 84 years and that since her widowhood she had lived by herself in the temple. I, I, I've adopted someone. I invite you to do the same. I call her Our Lady of Canyon Country. She lives on the sidewalk in Canyon Country. Her name is Layla. And I try to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit who has now prompted me to stop and make sure she has enough water to drink. I cannot force her to do any different than what she is doing. I don't have another situation to offer her over which I have control. But Layla, I hope she's surviving. It's getting colder at night. She's putting on extra layers. She's old. She's in the temple. And she's fasting and praying day and night. She's giving thanks to God and she is speaking of him to all who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Quick prophecy moment. We all know that Jerusalem and Babylon are opposite cities, yes? 
So I want to ask you as an Adventist pilgrim today, are you praying for the spiritual redemption of spiritual Jerusalem? Because my friends, there's a lot of people who need what Jerusalem has. And if Jerusalem's not giving it, then as some have said, the very stones will cry out. The very stones will cry out. She lives in the temple every day. She's there, she's fasting, she's praying. And when Mary and Joseph arrive with the baby, she tells everybody, this is him. Now I tell you, isn't it amazing that we can be Adventists today? We can be the people who are saying, Jesus is coming. In fact, we can be the people who say, look what he's been doing in my life. He's here. He's doing stuff. He's at work today in Los Angeles, in Santa Clarita. Are we excited about that job? Are we in the temple? Are we, are we excited about telling people he's here? He's, he's working. He's in the world today. Don't we sing that song? I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Did we tell anybody that this week? Come on now. We're Adventist pilgrims. We have the joy, like Anna, of being in, not out, but in She spoke to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She's there in the temple and she's praising God. You see, she's encouraging, she's encouraging a focus. Maybe, maybe we can grab onto this. SC7, Santa Clarita Adventist, Seventh Day Advent. Maybe we can be the ones who encourage a focus on the Messiah. Would that not be kind of what you see in the first angel's message? Remind me, what's the first angel's message? Pay attention. I like that better than fear because I think it's easier for us to understand. Pay attention to the God of heaven and earth. Because it doesn't just say any God. It says the God who made heaven and earth. The creator God. Hey, look at us. We're sitting here on the seventh day of the week on Sabbath because he is the creator God. He created Sabbath and we want to honor and worship him. Now, tomorrow, there will be a service here in this church. I will not be the pastor. We, we rent to a church that is a loving Christian fellowship. The only question I have is, do we know them? Do we care about them? Are we influential? Do we even care that we have influence in the lives of other people in Santa Clarita? I'm going, to, I'm going to put it forward to you that, that that is exactly what Anna was with her living in the temple. She was influencing people to be excited about the coming king. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I think that's a good mandate for us today, don't you think? He's coming again. Don't, can we get just a little excited about that, maybe? And, and say, look, he's, he's a risen savior. He's working in my life. He wants to and is working in your life, whether you know it or not. He is, and you can recognize it, and you can join me in being excited about it. She's, she's an evangelist. She's, a, she's an encourager. So since we claim to be the watchers for the second coming of the Messiah, the pilgrims, as it were, the, the Adventist pilgrims, are we, are we like Anna or Simeon? Are we like the shepherds where they're out in the field at work or in the temple at worship? Are we living with focus on the redemption of all peoples? 
all pilgrims, pilgrims of God, the people of God. Are we, are we focused on, on the coming of the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah? Simeon and Anna were pilgrims of old. Today, in almost 2020, we are those pilgrims. What will be the story that is told about us when he comes again, this time as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen.